All right, welcome back to another episode of Storytelling Deconstructed. Today we have a special guest, Matt Graham. Very excited to have him. He is uh, a new a new showrunner. I think this is uh, new is correct, right? This is your first show, right, Matt? It's my third show. Is it really? Yes. Wait, I'm sorry. For some reason, I was under the impression that this is the for the first one. I'm an idiot. I, I, I would love it. I would love it if that were the truth, because it would mean I was still young and impressionable, <laughs> and like I still had a con- I still had morals and a conscience, and I wasn't completely broken by Hollywood. <laughs> but unfortunately, the reality is it's not my first rodeo. Gotcha. Well, all right. Longtime showrunner Matt Graham, <laughs> no, no. Hollywood vet, titan of industry. Uh, I, I, I like that. I like that. Perfect. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Man on Fire, which is um, one of Matt's favorite movies. Yeah, here we go. Okay. So the very first thing, like I was saying before, I think what we should talk about is just that. So Eric mentioned that uh, he had never heard of the movie before. He watched it for the first time. This was my third or fourth watch. Um, All of us really like it. Matt loves it. Why is this movie great? Well, you know, I, I think that if, you, if you're just going to ask me for an initial thing to kick it off. Yeah. Um, you know, it's rare, it's rare to say that a film changed your life, right? But this movie did change my life. And, you know, when films change your life, they, do, they always do it in a kind of unexpected way, right? And what happened with this movie is that I saw it um, I think I, I first saw it in the cinema. I think I, I think I saw it. If I know I saw it at the Grove in 2004 when it came out. And I remember as the movie ended, I said to myself, I'm going to live in South America. Ironically, Mexico City is not in South America, but it's in Latin America. But that distinction was lost on me at the time. But um. And so because of this movie, I went to live in South America for five years. And that became a huge moment in my life. And it was um, my life totally changed because of it. So along with everything else that's happened to me in Hollywood, uh, this is one of the rare movies I can say did actually change my life. Aside from that, I think it's an incredibly interesting movie. I really enjoyed watching it when I first... It was one of those movies that really spoke to me when I first watched it. Um, you know, it's super violent, stylized. It's got that Tony Scott kind of thing. But more than, by the way, I really relate to Tony Scott as well. Um, But um, more than anything, it's such an interesting film because, and I think you you brought this up, Eric, before we started speaking, because it's actually a rare thing. It's, it's It's a chameleon. This movie is actually a serious drama disguised as an action film and it's and it's made by a guy who made his name as one of the creators of the action film itself in the 1980s and so it it represents him kind of playing with 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 a formula that he arguably created you know tony and ridley scott came over to to hollywood in the 80s uh they were they were big um advertising directors in the uk in the 70s and they were key in uh, being part of the massive change that rippled through Hollywood in the 1980s. You know, uh, personified by by the the you know the the creation of the action film itself. And obviously, Tony Scott is responsible for the movie Top Gun and Days of Thunder, which is hugely un- uh, uh, hugely underrated as well, and are obviously two of the best action films. So. Uh, aside from everything else the movie is just is just really interesting in terms of what it actually represents because i I kind of feel like it's the creator of a genre going back to his roots and doing something different with it totally it is it is a a drama disguised as an action film uh and that's i think i think that was kind of surprising to you wasn't eric like you were expecting an action movie yes With, with a with a title like man on fire and especially when you see the the movie poster the the picture that you would put on the cover of the DVD, uh, it really gives that vibe where it's just like, this is a guy that's come here to kick ass and take names and just like walk away from explosions while looking cool, which to be fair, there were a few of those where he just walked away from explosions looking cool. 
there's definitely a few of those moments, but uh, arguably what I would say is that this movie is kind of a psychological breakdown of a guy who's supposed to be the hard guy walking out of explosions looking cool, but deep down is actually a completely uh, broken alpha male. So in many ways, it kind of was way ahead of its time because it's, 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 about, it's about someone who's a, a classic you know, alpha male, harder than hard superhero who's actually um, appearances belie the fact that he's a totally broken man who's also incredibly sensitive and um, is very much a deep thinker. So it's it's really interesting. That might be a good point to dive into the actual movie because the first point that I wanted to make is I was very surprised at how much time the film took to actually have the inciting incident happen. And what I mean by that is as soon as that opening scene happens where you see a kidnapping occur in real time and then you meet Dakota Fanning's character, you know she's getting kidnapped. This movie would not exist if that was not going to happen. So all it is, you're on a timetable waiting for that to happen. And it does not happen until, I think I looked at the time, it didn't happen until the 50 minute mark. Exactly. This movie waits an hour. This movie has the longest first act ever, right? Because it literally waits nearly an hour before anything happens. Exactly. And it needed that in order to make the revenge part of the film emotional. Because with any other, if, if this film were in the hands of a lesser mind, they would have cut as quickly as they could to the revenge arc, where it's just like, okay, I'm just going to work from the low levels of revenge and work my way up to the heights of this organization. And that would be what a lesser filmmaker would do. But, but because they took the time to really build up a, an emotional connection between Denzel Washington's character and uh, Dakota's Fanning's character, that really made the revenge part way more emotional. I, you know, I totally agree. And that's actually, again, it just, go, just going back to Tony Scott, the, the director, that, ironically, one of his creations was the, uh, you know, uh, uh, super cool action hero type. Right. And so what's interesting about this film is that he totally deconstructs it because as you exactly to the point, speaking to the point that you've made is, is the first, you know, the opening 50 minutes of this movie uh, is watching how that archetype is underneath this kind of broken. He's created a guy who should be all of that and is just a completely broken human being. I mean, if you, if you look at the time code, I think it's about, my guess is around the 20 minute mark where the guy tries to commit suicide. I mean, you've got a, you've got a movie where um, in, the, in the opening first, you know, in the first act, your main character tries to kill themselves. I mean, and so, and, and that's, you know, in terms of storytelling, that's pretty bold. You know, you, you've also got a, you've also got a story where the guy is, clearly an out and out alcoholic you know um by his own admission you know there's this very powerful scene when uh you know he says to the to the to the father you know um i drink and the father's like how could anyone afford you judging by a resume and he's like basically he says i drink you know i i'm 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 washed up i'm i'm completely subtext i'm completely broken and from a storytelling point of view, this is super clever because it it completely pulls you in. You, you, it totally wrong foots you, and you're like, I just want to know about this guy. I just feel this tremendous sympathy for him because I don't really know about any. You never really find out anything that he's done. You just know that it's bad. His very first line to Rayburn, Christopher Walken's character, another great character by the way, is. Do you think God will ever forgive us for what we've done? So you you know you never you never actually get any specifics. 
you know, you know that he's done all this kind of counterintelligence work and you find out later in the second act that he's been in, you know, Pakistan and Thailand and stuff. But all we know is that he's done a lot of terribly bad things. And so uh, Brian Helgeland, the screenwriter, who's obviously one of the Hollywood big gun screenwriters, you know, he he makes you feel this tremendous sympathy for this character right away you know and um it's just really interesting because you're watching a guy who should be at the very top of his game and yet he's at rock bottom the second we meet him every scene he's drinking he's listening to this you know uh really kind of sad song the blue bayou song and he's just like sitting most of the scenes he's sitting around in his room drinking and then like, like i said minute 20 i think he tries to blow his brains out. I mean, we, we, we can't help but be interested in this guy. You know a story beat is great when it could only have happened at that point in the story. So not only does that suicide beat, not only is that story beat shocking to the audience, like, whoa, I can't believe that they went there this early in the movie. But it also serves as a turning point for Creasy's character because at the beginning, he's very cold and distant to Dakota Fanning's character, even though she makes many polite overtures to him. But he's so rude that she actually has to get out of the car and move to the back seat because she's sick of his demeanor towards her. And so that attempt at suicide, it's the turning point in his emotional the way he acts towards her, because it's almost like he views it as a miracle that the bullet misfired and it didn't end his life. And from then on out, the relationship between the two of them really starts to blossom. And it's the thing they bond over, in fact, happens to be a gun, specifically trying to, trying to make her less flinchy with the starting gun, because that's his whole life. He's been he's had a gun in his hand almost his whole life. So he knows that specific skill. So it's like that point where the suicide happens has all these various implications that then branch out into later parts of the story. And that's why that's an excellent story beat. It has all those layers stacked on top of each other. I had forgotten um, when the, the, that happened. I forgot he attempts suicide. I mean, this, uh, this most recent watch, it kind of caught me by surprise. And I remember thinking leading up to it, like, I I remember, because my memory of the movie was that it, it was a very good movie and that they successfully navigated all the tricky story that they were trying to tell. And leading up to that moment, I was going like, how are they going to do the things that they need to do? I forget. And then it was like, then that happened. I was like, oh, yeah this happens. I forgot. And I remember thinking that was really the only way they could have done that because um, I, I can't think of anything else that could have effectively felt like it closed that chapter of Creasy's life and opened the new one. You know, it, it was the perfect thing. It was the only, not, not the perfect thing. It was the only thing I felt like that, that felt justified and felt like it earned the turning of the page. Uh, anything else felt like it wouldn't have been earned. You know what I mean? It would have been like, I don't buy that now all of a sudden he's letting her in when he was, because we're told that about, like Matt was saying, we're, we were, like you were saying, Matt, um, you know, we were told about uh, all these horrific things he's done. We're, we're, we're really, it's really hammered into us. The ex how deep in the hole he is in the emotional hole. Like he's tortured by the demons of his past. He can't get out. It's ruining him. He's an alcoholic. This is just a sort of a hypothetical question, but that's the only thing they could have done, right? I mean, was there any way else to get us through that moment? Well, I, I, I mean, I think that, you know, just from a character point of view, the fact that he tries to kill himself just shows you graphically where he's at as a person. I mean, he is absolutely at the, you know, rock bottom. You know, he's drunk. It's the middle of the night. He tries to shoot himself, and it's just a miracle that the gun doesn't go off. In fact, it comes back later uh, because they, they 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 joke about the bullet, don't they? You know, Rayburn says it's a bad primer. Um, you know, um, so I just think from a character point of view, it just tells you that um, he can't go any further down. And like you say, his dy the, the dynamic of his relationship to the girl starts to blossom because – 
he's got nowhere else to go down quite simply and yeah. and 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 he's he's helpless and he starts t- to let her in and it's really a cruel trick played by the movie that cuz the reality is it turns out he actually could go lower and the way he could go lower is that this seemingly miraculous event of the suicide being thwarted and him essentially using that as the launching point to s- start to bond with PETA, Dakota Fanning's character. Uh, it was a cruel thing to do to a character to give him that hope. Because, like I said, at the beginning of the movie, you know she's getting kidnapped. You just know it. And so you're just waiting for it to happen. And the whole time, you're just watching... You're watching Creasy's life be transformed in this positive way. And in the back of your mind, there's this encroaching feeling that's like, oh, no, this is all going to come smashing down. Totally. And like this is the whole. So there's two things going on. You know, the whole tension of the first act is that you're waiting for the moment when she gets kidnapped. You know, it's going to happen. Uh, it's built up because you see the car following them, you know, the, with the number plate that, that he takes down. Uh, you know, there's a rising tension going on because you know that it's going to happen. And we've seen the, 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 the credits of the film where you see a kidnapping, like you pointed out. So you know that's going to happen. Secondly, like you said, you know psychologically what the effect is going to be on Creasy. Because as Rayburn, who kind of acts as our Greek chorus into Creasy, later in the movie says, she taught him how to live again. She taught him it was okay to live again. And so you know that when that hope is snatched away from him, it's going to be especially bad. And the whole conceit of the character in in the movie is you're watching what happens when he does go to an even darker place. And his solution is he's going to kill them all. What does he say to the to the wife? He says, I'm going to kill everyone. I'm going to kill everyone who profited by it. I'm going to kill anyone who opens their eyes at me. He, I'm going to kill them all. And and that's the whole point of the film. You, we're taking this character to like these guys totally picked on the wrong guy, you know, because they picked on the one guy who thought it was okay to live again, and they took it away from him. And now they're going to reap the whirlwind. Yeah, it's it's part of a it's there's another element of the of the genius of taking the time that they did to get to the kidnapping and the end of the first act was that it, it was uh, one of the things that did is it was also a sort of a subversion of that expectation. Um, we're wait, like you said, we know it's going to happen from the beginning. We're waiting for it, waiting for it. And of course, our storytelling instincts, because everybody has them, because we've seen so many stories uh, telling us that it's going to happen at the 20 to 30 minute mark, like most inciting incidents happen at. And when it doesn't happen there, part of what that does is uh, it makes it's like we can't. I don't, I don't want to say we forget that it's going to happen, but it it ta- it kind of goes like, oh, it didn't happen. And then like 20 more minutes go by and you kind of, it almost has the opposite effect. Like uh, there's a, Eric and I had talked about this thing that can happen before uh, where, where um, uh, it can, that can be a negative thing where if you don't, if you set something up and you take too long to pay it off, that the audience can almost kind of forget that they wanted it. And then by the time you pay it off, it's like too late. And it's like, you don't care anymore. And this is almost the opposite of that in a good way. The anticipation of the kidnapping takes long enough such that we kind of forget about it. And that kind of lets us seep in to the intimate drama between Creasy and PETA such that when the kidnapping does happen, it's almost a surprise again. Well, what I would argue, what I would argue specifically from a storytelling point of view is that uh, the second half of the first act, the, the, whatever, the third sequence or whatever, um, it just deepen. It, it, we're, we're deepening their relationship uh, in a way that's unexpected to the audience. Like you say, in a in a conventional r- revenge film, in twenty minutes in, the kidnapping would happen. But this movie just takes extra long to get there, and their relation, the relationship between Creasy and Peter, specifically in the swimming sequence, goes to an unexpectedly deep place. By the extent that when the piano lesson sequence happens, uh, you know, as the audience, you really don't know what's happening anymore. You you think there's going to be a kidnapping attempt coming, and of course there is going to be, but we've taken so long to get there that we've now let the audience become lost in their relationship, and we've literally 
uh, the story's taken on almost a kind of another feel. You almost feel like you're, wait, am I going to be watching a drama now? You know, is, is this going to be a drama about Creasy and the girl? You know, do you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it, I, I would argue that it just takes, it just takes longer to get there um, because we just increase the stakes for the character, right? The character has gone to a point where by the beginning of the piano lesson moment, he simply cannot afford to lose her. He's gone from being just a bodyguard who cares about her. He's actually gone to a place where he actually cannot afford to lose her. And the moment when that happens is the moment when she gives him the medallion, the St. Jude medallion in the restaurant. And it's that moment when he, I mean, to, for want of a better phrase, he, he starts to need her. He falls in love with her. And he lets her in in a way, this character's probably ne never let anyone in in his whole life. We'll never know what Creasy's former relationships were, even if he had any. But this is the moment when he lets his guard down. The one thing that this guy never does, he becomes vulnerable. And he becomes lost in their relationship. And so he's at his most vulnerable when suddenly, you know, the policia judicial turn up uh, and the, the guy with the sunglasses arrive and the, the kidnapping go, goes down. They yeah. get him at his most vulnerable. Let's, let's talk about why the kidnapping feels so good. Because something you notice when you watch a ton of stories is sometimes even a story beat that you're expecting the director or the writer makes it not feel quite right. But there are a ton of little things that Tony Scott and the screenwriter do to set up, to, to, to foreshadow the fact that this is gonna happen at the piano lesson. Because let me say, I was fooled. I thought the kidnapping was gonna happen at the swim meet. So it's like right as she was about to have a triumphant moment, she was gonna get kidnapped there. Uh, I was wrong about that. And also I was starting to feel what Cody was saying about, okay, it really feels like it's about time that this happened and this would be a good place to do it. But they did not do it at the swim meet. They did it at the piano lesson. So why does it feel good at the piano lesson? Here are my thoughts on it. First of all, the use of music in this movie, I thought was very wisely done. So the first time we meet Peta, she's playing the piano. And what is she playing on the piano? Debussy's Claire de Lune. And you hear that piece as a score to the movie throughout that entire first act. It just will pop up to, uh, to evoke nostalgia or like an, like an intimate moment. And it appears and appears and appears. And, it's, and then... After she wins the swim meet and she realizes she's more interested in swimming than in the piano, it sets up this dichotomy. And that's a genius thing because then the parents more are forcing her towards piano when her passion lies with swimming. So that way, after she gets kidnapped at the piano lesson, it gives them a feeling that they're complicit in the kidnapping, which leaves a lasting guilt, which is a great storytelling device. So the foreshadowing of the piano lesson through the fact that the first time we see Peta, she's playing the piano and the fact that the piece she's playing appears as a light motif throughout that entire first act, it really makes that kidnapping sparkle because Cody and I talk about this all the time, even when it's done poorly. And in this case, it's not done poorly. The way to make story beats feel good when they happen is to leave these little clues beforehand that you can pay off later. It's just a simple Chekhov's gun rule. You, if you have a gun hanging on the wall in act one, you have to use it in act three. If Pete is playing the piano the first time we see her and you use this music throughout the first act, it then feels really good when it's at the piano lesson that she's kidnapped. And by feel good, I mean, obviously it's a terrible moment, a traumatic moment, but it feels good from a storytelling perspective. I, I, I also think there's a, there's an interesting um, moment between them, between the two characters at that point, because Creasy is responsible for 
she she's made him vulnerable, right? But he's responsible for making her vulnerable. And she's a confident girl who generally does what her parents want, obviously. But he convinces her to sabotage their wishes and to go for what she really cares about, which is swimming. And it's so, so it, you, you're seeing these two characters really riffing off each other. I mean, really I mean, he's teaching her, he's teaching her probably the most valuable life lesson there is, which is have the courage to go after what you really care about. Don't worry about what other people think. Just go for what you really care about. A valuable lesson that, um, you know, it, we all learn at some point, you know? Yeah. And it really ties into this idea. I mean, they, they really do such a great job with the gun motif because it really ties into this idea of because i mean really his arc is about forgiveness right i mean that's what you brought up what you brought up earlier with the the quote about will god forgive us it's about is he worthy of being forgiven and the whole thing with Peter, they did such a it's so brilliant to use the gun and the swimming because that's obviously a metaphor for his area of expertise and violence and guns. And his ability to bring that expertise to her and help her is the reason that he that he is redeemable, that that his past actions can actually have value and bring goodness going forward. They're not purely a source of darkness and evil and horror. Um and so his ability to, like you're saying, have that influence on her and encourage her to stand up for herself is him transmuting his past darkness into future and, and present goodness. Well, the, the, the whole, the whole I, I guess, I hate, I hate this word, but the whole conceit of the movie, if you like, is playing with the audience's perception of violence itself. Because Creasy does all of this incredibly I mean, unbelievably violent stuff throughout the, the film. I mean, he tortures people to death. Uh, he kills numerous people. Um, he's an incredibly menacing and violent character. Um, but yet it's all in the service of good, ostensibly. So it, it just forces the audience to ask the, the, the question, is such violence justified when it's employed in, uh, in you know, for for good you know and and that's a very difficult question to answer because you know there, there is no answer to it because you know we want him to rescue peter we know the kidnappers are evil but do their actions justify such an absolute orgy of violence which he unleashes and which obviously come from this guy's i mean all this guy's known in his life is is this terrible darkness and he uses that darkness to do something that's good you know, and it's kind of like, you know, Rayburn says, you know, Creasy's an artist, uh, you know, and, and, and death is his art. Yeah, that's such a great line. Yeah, it's probably the best line in the film, right? And it's, yeah. and it, it really, it's a direct challenge to the audience. You know, what's your perception? Do you think that such violence is justified in the service of good? You know, it's it, it and and there is no answer to that question. Yeah, it's really interesting the structure of this movie because it's it's a little bit different than um from a char- from an internal character emotion perspective than most movies because uh for most movies I, I always I talk about this all the time but like the fundamental driving engine of a story is a character's uh, beliefs being challenged. Uh, and the pressure to change as a result. And so the way most movies are set up is that the, the the arc of the story is that you have a character who has beliefs they about whatever they are, about the world, about themselves, about somebody else, whatever. And then they experience the plot of the movie and that plot gives them counter examples or essentially a reason to doubt those beliefs. And then that's the challenge to their beliefs. And that challenge presents a decision point where they have to make decisions about actions that they're going to carry out. Do you stay true to your beliefs or do you change your beliefs? And then that's sort of the dramatic engine of the story. They take that action. That action has results in the world. And then uh, those ramifications then reflect on you either made the right choice or the wrong choice. And in th- what's interesting about this, I mean, that's sort of the arc. That's the end of the movie. It's like co- conclusion. Was it good or bad? Or what does it mean for them What that about the decision that they made? End of movie. And this movie kind of gets to that point faster because the challenge to his beliefs is PETA. And the beliefs at the beginning are that I'm irredeemable. And, um, and then PETA challenges that and changes it such that by the, t- by the end of the first act, he essentially has changed his beliefs. He believes that he isn't irredeemable and that there is something worth living for. 
And then the fight for the rest of the movie is just to maintain that. It's just to don't lose that. And the, I mean, we're, we're kind of jump. This is kind of jumping to the end, but the moment that I feel like makes the entire movie work. And it was, it, it feels like it just, it just, it hinged on one moment was when she, when he's on the bridge at the end and she, they let her go to do the hostage exchange and she screams his name. She screams Creasy and runs into his arms. And the key thing in my view is the scream because she screams his name, not her mom's name, his name. And what that tells us is that, yes, it was all justified. It was worth it. He had the impact on her that she had on him. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, actually. I mean, I, what's really interesting about this film is that just in terms of storytelling, I mean, this character doesn't change at all on one level. It has no change. It has no arc at all, right? He's just a total killer. But on another level, he changes profoundly, like you said, because he basically believes it's okay to live again. This is a guy who's who wants to die and she teaches him that it's okay to live. And so, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that's a great point how everything kind of builds that moment. And, and, you know, honestly, just, just, just to be cheesy, you know, uh, uh, she says, you know, I love you, Creasy. And he says, I love you, you know, and um, th- th- it's unthinkable that that character could ever get to that place at the beginning of this film. So on the one level, the character doesn't change at all. But on, but on another level, he, he, his, his whole outlook is altered. So it's, it's really interesting because that's a very, very deeply internal character change. Yeah. What's interesting is I think it just goes a level deeper because like, I think the bad way of doing it would have been just the I love you. Like that alone is shallower, I think, in a weird way because um, you know it's that weird thing where it's like everybody I know is I love you is like the deepest thing you can say to a person. And in that way, it is almost not as deep as it as other things because of that. And if, if that's all there is, is it's just like, hey, we spent some time together and now we're affectionate for each other. It's like, okay, that's fine. But there's a deeper thing, which is that he was able to be a positive influence on her um, and give her something constructive, like that helped her as a person and to grow. Like he was, he, right? Like he brought something material and that had substance to her life that she wouldn't have had if he hadn't been there. So it was more than just like, hey, good feelings. It was like, no, 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 he really is doing something genuinely good. And that justifies him having continued to live and not having killed himself. Like he, if he had killed himself, that good thing would have been lost from the world. Yeah, he's 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 been able, after a lifetime of having a negative influence on the world, in his opinion, he's yeah. he's actually had a positive influence on someone. Yeah, yeah. And and that, and that's why to me like it's the scream that does it and not the I love you, um, because the scream I, I don't know it's it's I'm kind of splitting hairs I guess but it feels like it's this thing of like I need you not just I love you like mm. uh, which I guess is a subtlety but for me it it was it was the difference that made the difference I mean that's the moment I get the chills I got chills when she screamed his name not when she said I love you and he said it back you know. I don't know. It's it's a subtle point, but point, but. from a from a writing point point of view, it's a it's a it's a very powerful moment. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Because you know this this movie has a very very linear structure. Uh, you know, he literally just kills one person after the other. Um, yeah. You know, so and and it's kind of like the the interesting moment is uh, uh, I think it, I would say it's the end of the second act when he discovers she's actually alive. Because remember, they think that she's been killed by La Voss. It's super linear. This is, this is a big realization for me in my writing. Because there's this phrase that people use all the time, which is like, oh, it wrote itself. It wrote itself. It writes itself. Yeah, it's the most, the most hateable phrase I can think of. Right. Yeah, it's detestable. Um, and, and for me, the, the, what, makes that, what, made, what makes that, what made that cliche real and not stupid and detestable was I realized that like what, what that really means is like it, it, something writes itself if you do the work t- to beforehand to make that happen. So in other words, like I think, you know, and this is a perfect example in this movie of the acts 
really at main, mainly act two, two and a half, that whole middle section of the movie is middle to the last section of the movie where it's just uh, killing up the ladder. It is. It's just on rails. And it, 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 it is entirely made or broken by everything it's set up previous to that. If you do the work right in those previous acts and you really set it up on a nuanced and complex and deep level, then those ones just get to coast and, and are just extremely satisfying the whole step of the way. So it's like the the principle there, I feel like, is that is not that you always have to make every part of your story extremely complex and weaving and, and everything always has to be this Game of Thrones tapestry. Um, it's OK to just go straight and shoot linearly sometimes if you have earned that previously. Look, it, uh, this movie structure is really simple, right? The, the first act makes us care about the characters. The second act makes us want to find out what happens to them. And the third act, it just shows you what happens in the end. But the whole point is that we, we're watching because we care about them so much. Sure. But you say that like it's easy to make somebody care about a character. That's not easy. No, it's, no, it's very, very difficult, um, of course. But um, just, just from, a, from, a, from a writing point of view, I mean, that's, the, that's, that's how this movie works. First hour... Make get uh, builds empathy with the two. You know, it pulls back the tension, and then it just releases it. And you watch him kill everyone who who fuck with him. But we care about, but, but we're invested. It's not just another, you know, super violent revenge story because we care so much about him, and that's what makes this movie different. Sure, definitely. What one of the things I like about this film. Um, is the absolutely marvelous array of supporting characters. Yeah. I mean, yeah. this movie has is so wonderfully cast. You know, you've yeah. got Mickey Rourke as the kind of American expat corrupt lawyer um, living in Mexico City. He's clearly, you know, involved up to the wazoo with, you know, the his rich 1% of clients. Um, you've got... Um, Giancarlo Espos- uh, uh, Giancarlo Giannini's character, the um, uh, Mexican police officer, who's uh, always so the amazing uh, female reporter who Creasy b- befriends. I mean, these wonderful, and, and of course, topped off by all of them by the amazing Christopher Walken's character, Rayburn. Really yeah, so Rayburn is super interesting because he acts as the Greek chorus of the film. And, and and what's interesting about all of these characters is that they all basically do one thing. They all amplify Creasy's menace. They're all there to go, Creasy is seriously bad and you should stay away from him. And so they're, all of them f- fulfill the same function. They all build up Creasy in the eyes of the audience and tell you how dangerous he is. And um, Rayburn, of course, more more than any of them, because he's been friends with what we what we uh, ascertain is that these guys have been friends. They've presumably had some kind of a relationship. They've been comrades in arms in uh, whatever military forces Creasy's been involved with. And um, it, it, you know, it, uh, Rayburn also really humanizes Creasy before he meets Peter. Because he te- because it tells the audience, you know, it's okay to like this guy because this guy has friends and he has friends who really care about him. And I, I, I really love Christopher Walken's performance in this movie because he's he's tremendously warm towards Creasy, and you know, it's such, it's such great, it's such a great actor because you know, he, Christopher Walken really tells you, you know, it's okay to love Creasy. You make a great point. This is a real life in the wild example of uh, something they teach in like screenwriting textbooks, which is that all of the supporting characters in a story, they all exist in relationship to the main character and their journey. So you start with the main character and you ask yourself what emotional beats do they need to hit along their arc? And then you populate the world of your story with other characters who serve a purpose in relationship to that. So for example, if you need a window into Creasy's backstory, how do you do that? You introduce Rayburn's character, who, who 
was able to shed light on who Creasy used to be and allude to the horrors that they participated in in their shared past. He was able to speak to Creasy's proficiency at killing and so on. This is one of those writing 101 things where it's like, it's there's not a ton of use in us just like going super deep into that because it's kind of obvious, but it is kind of interesting just to see a good example of it being put into practice. It's like when you're having to do cheesy story problems in math class. Alice is riding on a train from Berlin. If Bob is on another train from Hamburg, and then like it turns out actually that's pretty useful and you actually use that sometimes. One of my favorite scenes from the movie is when Rayburn comes to the swim meet, or maybe he wasn't there for the swim meet, but he's celebrating with them afterwards. And he tells that the, uh, Creasy and him are riffing and they're telling the story about how we all have these plans in our life, but then, oh, he met a girl and now he has a family and the plan was derailed. And in a lot of ways, that's what happened with Creasy too. Uh, I mean, not in the same way, but like he was planning on committing suicide, but PETA saved him. And it, it was just sort of a delightful moment where the movie basked in positive energy. It, it's another thing because the whole time you're thinking, man, Peter's get, I know Peter's going to get kidnapped, but there's this really charming moment that's just like a one-off in the whole movie that it's, it, you, and it's one of my favorite because it's so delightful. Which is also an example of just the very simple principle of showing emotional extremes. This is one of the first things that clicked for me about how to write stories, which is that the audience calibrates their emotional reality to the highest and lowest points in the story. In other words, if everything in the movie is sad, if you just try to sit in a sad mood the whole time, then what ends up happening is you become numb to it and nothing feels very sad. Conversely, if you have a really happy moment that comes earlier and then you have something really sad that happens, the sad things feels way sadder. Totally, because it because it, it just shows you these these the humanity of all these characters before something really bad happens to them. And so, in other words, it just builds up the fact, it just builds up the tragedy of what, what you know is coming. And what I think is really interesting about the relationship between Rayburn and Creasy, which you, you actually just touched on, is that, you know, in many ways, Rayburn is the successful version of Creasy because he's had this exactly the same experience. They've both been in the military and Creasy has, has transitioned into being a successful businessman. Uh, he runs a security company in Juarez, and he looks after. Um, I think he looks after Japanese uh, bi business, uh, uh, Japanese factory owners, and um, he's got a wife. He's got kids, and he's got a very happy life, which is you know kind of um, brought home by the um, sort of heavenly pool party scene. You know, in the, in, the, in the first few minutes, and he's he's also very very uh happily in love with his wife um and so it's just you know creasy by contrast is a guy who's like drinking himself to, to death and on the verge of suicide so it, it also kind of like tells the audience like you know whatever that whatever that dream that they both had i mean the sad truth is that it, it died in creasy maybe maybe rayburn stepped away from it to to settle down but increasingly whatever it was it died and i think i think just just going back to the other characters um uh you know um the mexican police officer is is a really interesting character too i mean all of these my supporting characters are great but the mexican police officer is really interesting because um i love this guy he's he he is a totally like mad like uh, uh you know he's a highly accomplished police officer you know he's he's you know, he tells you right away, you know, he's worked for Interpol in Rome and he's a, he's a high ranking cop, but he, you know, he, he loves the pastry shop by the hospital and he's desperately in love with the female reporter. He doesn't want to admit it, but he's completely head over heels in love with her in one of the movies, really interesting little relationships, you know, that it doesn't really, we don't really, Tony Scott never really goes there, but you understand that, that, um, and this guy in his own way, you know, he really gets, he's a deep thinker. He really gets Greasy. Uh, and he's kind of one of the interesting characters that, you know, pepper the world of Man on Fire. Totally. One of the things that, uh, I, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's this feeling that you want to cultivate, I feel like, in a story where the way I always like to articulate it is that, like, 
this just happens to be the focal story. But if we if had we just turned the camera this way instead of this way, there would have been just as fascinating story to follow in this guy's life or in this other character's life. Yes. This guy, oh yeah. This guy this guy's th- 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 this guy's completely uh you know um frustrated uh, you know this is a guy who just is absolutely in love with the with the with with the reporter and and doesn't know how to get her you know there, there's that great moment where he goes when are we going to sleep again yeah when are we going to sleep t- together again and she goes we don't sleep together we fuck and you can see the disappointment in his face yeah these minor characters were some of the richest that i've seen in action movies absolutely action. even though so like the like creasy pita and the uh, and a few others they're like tier one characters and with with a good screenwriter, you expect the tier one characters and then also maybe the tier two characters to also be rich. But this movie went a step farther and like the tier three characters were also had some level of complexity. And an example of this, uh, before I explain this, uh, one concept that Cody and I talk about all the time, especially in things that are action based or battle based is we've come up with this term called battling up the ladder. And this happens a lot in like fighting things where it's like that's a bit to be fair. That's your that's your ter- you came up with that, Eric. That's that's your term. Keep going. Where like you, you see where it's like first you have to defeat the henchman's henchman, and then you have to defeat the henchman, and then you have to defeat the person who the henchman is the henchman to. But then they're not the real deal. There's someone above them, and you have to fight them. But then they're not the big cheese either, and you keep going up and up and up. And that's pretty much what the entire second act of this movie is, is you're just battling up that ladder. And one of the great details in this movie is one thing that Creasy was really good at in his revenge onslaught was he would torture the characters, but he, in order to extract the information, he would give them the hope that maybe he would let them go. To, to extract the information. And then once he got the information, he would dispose of them. And each of these characters that he's battling up the ladder for had a different reaction when they realized, I am not being let go. It's over for me now. So the first, I believe the first character that Creasy encounters is the one where he duct tapes him to the steering wheel. And then he's torturing them by cutting off his fingers. He's a he's a he's a corrupt police officer. Yes, in, in one of the movie's most uh, unpleasant scenes, and there there are many unpleasant scenes in this film. Yes, and in his moment when he realizes he's not being let go, he asks for a cigarette, I believe, before Creasy finally disposes of him with a gunshot to the head. So he's like he's seen it all, and he's a cool he's a calm character. So he when he realizes it's over, he accepts it with grace but then when creasy goes to the nightclub to the rave and he asks questions of i don't remember his name but jersey boy yes he's called he's called jersey boy and he gets the information extracted from him which is kind of easy because he's not like you know he's not in that world he's not really like a tough guy uh so he just gives out the information with very little pushback but creasy's not going to let him go either and when he realizes it, he had a brief moment where uh, it almost seemed like he was going to beg for his life. But he looked like you would see the look of shock. And I was almost hoping they would bathe in that moment a little more. So that way it was more salient. It, it, it was only like one line, though. But I noticed the difference. And this happened a lot where when characters finally accepted their doom, they would react in a way that was very personal to them. And... Like that's the hallmark of a good script when even these tier three or four characters have their own unique way of behaving. Well, I, I think that what's really interesting about this, this film, which, which, you're, which, you're, which you're touching on here, is the fact that absolutely every character has a very strong, powerful inner life. You know, we've talked about Rayburn. We've talked about the Mexican cop, the bad guys. I mean, these are these are people who are unexpectedly deep yes deeper than most people i know (laughs) way i I mean i mean this is i mean this is for an action movie this is way off base because these characters are way deeper than they should be 
And the reason for that is very simple because you, because the movie invites you to feel bad for them when they get killed. And it reminds you that what Creasy's is doing is evil. He's turning the tables on them and he's visiting them with the same violence that they visited on, you know, the defenseless people. And so the movie's really fucking with your emotions here because it generally in the scenes when he tortures people, you feel especially bad for the people who are being tortured, even though you know they're evil because he's, 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 you know, for want of a better word, sadistically playing with them. Yeah. It's complexifying the morality of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and, and so almost all of the characters in this film have, have a very, have an unexpectedly deep inner life, even the bad guys, you know, um, Jersey boy is an interesting character because this is a guy that, you know, all we know about him is that he's also from, we actually learned something interesting about Creasy at that point. He's from New Jersey. And do you remember the girl asks him, where are you from? And he, he says no state in particular. You actually yeah. learn he's from Jersey. Um, the um, the interesting thing is that like this guy is also really interesting. Like he's he 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 runs a nightclub in Mexico City. Like what's he doing there? You know, there's a guy with an interesting life story. You know, um, yes. all of these characters. You you feel like you could get you could you could isolate all of these characters and they would all have tremendously interesting backstories. Jordan Kalfas, the lawyer who ends up getting murdered off camera um, played by Mickey Rourke in one of his, in the, one of these wonderful cameos, you know, this is a guy like, what is this guy's story? You know, um, I always think Mickey Rourke is such an interesting face. Uh, one of the most moving moments in this movie is when Mariana, the female journalist, she's going to drop off the pictures of the voice. So that way they can be published in the newspaper and the brother meets her in the dead of night, kills her chauffeur, and threatens her and says, and says, you better not publish these pictures or you're next. And she does it anyways. And it's like, what tremendous courage that that would take to know that your life is in jeopardy and do the follow through and do the right things anyway. I, I That was another moment I wish they had bathed in a little more. Just to, just to uh, you know, there's two points there that are really interesting. Firstly, I, I actually find that, that that moment is very powerful. I, I would have personally loved to see her make that decision on screen. Yes, yes, yes. Just yes. from a writing point of view, I, I found it was kind of a cheat and it, it left me feeling a bit unsatisfied that you, you just see that she's published the, the pictures and we're not present for her making that decision. If this was a TV series, we'd spend a whole episode getting into her head and watching her find the courage to publish those photos. Secondly, what's really interesting is that, of course, you know, just from just from a reality point of view, um, in Mexico, of course, this is a country where, it, according to the United Nations, it's the most dangerous country to be a journalist. Um, and and these these guys do that all the time, you know, and. and um, you know, and, and I, th you know, this this movie actually takes place pre all of that really bad drug violence. But I think that's it, that's a really interesting, it's a really interesting kind of real fact that this film touches on. Yes, a great point. Yes, movies or stories are all about the pressure to make decisions. And the point you're making right now, I feel like, is a stumbling play, a stumbling point that like almost every single story I can I see make, uh, falls down on. Like they all make this mistake. It's like we you want. To what you want to linger on decisions. I just, I feel like I never, uh, I shouldn't say never. I feel like I often feel dissatisfied with um, the how much, and this movie did it a lot. In most of its cases, it did a very good job. But in this one particular moment we're talking about, it's just like, I want to, I want to linger on this this decision and had to ha have the difficulty of making the decision. That's the essence of the entire story. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it uh, I, I found that this, this moment is interesting from a character point of view because it tells us she's very brave, which we kind of already know. Uh, but it's um, uh, that moment is really interesting from a character point of view because it tells us that, because it tells us that the reporter is very brave and that she's not phased by having a gun pointed in her face. She still publishes the photos. But from a writing standpoint, I find that to be one of the weaker moments because we're completely not present for her making that that decision, which is obviously a big no-no in writing. Yes, I agree. The, the courage was present in the action, and I was really moved by the courage. 
But yeah, you need to dramatize a little more. Like I said, in, in TV, this would have been a whole episode. Uh, I have a few things because we missed a few characters and uh, just some points. Uh, so I have a few questions. Uh, I mean, one of them's a question. Uh, I want to talk about Fuentes a little bit because we skipped over him when we were talking about the interesting minor characters. Creasy saves a very specific and brutal punishment for Fuentes. What is specific about Fuentes that leads Creasy to have his revenge be, I'm going to plant a bomb up your ass? Well, f- I mean, Fuentes is, is the, is, I mean, he's especially venal and awful because, look, Fuentes is a police officer, right? He's, in fact, he's a high ranking police officer and he's supposed to be one of those people that help you. You know, you know, we employ the police to help us when we need, you know, in times of emergency, right? And so it's especially heinous when, someone who's supposed to be the agent of of um strength and justice in the world is actually you know when it's a criminal that has a badge it's especially bad when a police officer violates that sacred trust that the public put in them it's a spe- it's an especially vi- vile transgression you know um, when a police officer commits crimes, it's especially bad because we're trusting them to implement justice. And Fuentes is a guy who is absolutely irredeemable in the sense that he's played the system all the way. He's a high-ranking cop. He's actually uh, in charge of a, of a secret brotherhood of corrupt police officers, sort of like the Rampart police scandal in, in lovely Los Angeles, you know. And um, he's a he's a he's a at some point he's blurred the line between criminal and police officer you know so he's he's an especially bad character and he also uh you know honestly in the movie he profits from the victims of kidnapping right think about what he does he works with kidnappers to further victimize the victims of kidnappers by stealing their ransom money i mean this is an especially evil yes. person yes so he i mean and he was the person who pushed the voice over the edge. And exactly. he is the reason that Creasy and everyone thinks that PETA is dead. He right. Blew, he blew. Because if the if the ransom had gone off as planned, PETA would still would be returned to them alive. alive. Correct, correct. He he he's the cause of all the problems in the film. Because it was his opportunism that led him, I think, to try to steal the ransom money. Yes. And this is another great moment where a character realizes they're not going to be let go. This is one of the best action scenes in the movie, in my opinion, because you don't see this very often where a scene takes place in real time. They put the timer on the screen, five minutes, and you watch it. I don't remember there being any skips in the clock. You watch that five minutes go by in real time, and he extracts the information he needs to extract. And you can see at the end, Fuentes is like, so you're going to let me go now. <laughs> and, and it's like, oh, that's Creasy's like, oh, that's so cute. No, 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 no. You're not being let go. And in fact, you're going to explode and I'm going to walk away in a cool way that every action hero does. It's, it's a particularly chilling moment. Yes. One more character I wanted to talk about was the father, because he is also complicit. I, I think he's the only character who Creasy changes his mind about, because at first it seems like he... Uh, the father, his name is Samuel Ramos. He seems like he's an innocent bystander. And it's just like this terrible thing. But then it turns out he's the main reason why she was kidnapped. He, he, he essentially sold her to kidnappers so he could pay down some of his father's debts. But they did that cool little twist where they made him a little bit sympathizable. Where he's like, I didn't know that the ransom was going to get stolen. I thought that she was just going to sit in a room and watch movies for a few days. And then I would get her back. But then the whole thing went sour. It's a, he's a victim too, which makes you, and that little moment of empathy with him is what then makes what follows, again, uh, you know, it fucks with the audience because you know that deep down, you know, Ramos is just a is just a victim too. And ultimately, he takes his own life, right? He feels the guilt. Okay. Yes, he uses the bullet. He's given the bullet that 
had the bad primer that actually now goes off. Two more quick points. Uh, first of all, this is one of my big critiques of the movie. Uh, Cause we talked about, this is connected to when we talked about the courage of the journalist not being dramatized properly and how something was lost in that moment. A moment that the entire film hinged on was the was the, the devastation of Peta's death sinking in. And I remember the whole thing from when she's kidnapped to the when we find out she's dead and the whole deal goes sour in between. That happens within the course of like three minutes. What, was the, uh, since you're an expert on this movie, Matt, was there a reason why they zoomed through that? Yeah, because because from a from a from a structural point of view, because Creasy's not conscious during that time, so it's just it's just information that he's going to learn, and we're not present with him, so it's it's a slightly expositional moment. That's that's my instinctive guess for you. I I, I only bring that up because I really wanted the devastation of that moment to hit me. And I felt that just because the time that went by was so fast, it the moment when we learn that she's dead did not hit me. What did hit me was a few moments later when uh, Creasy reads her diary and it says over and over again, I love my Creasy bear. Like that's when the devastation sinks in, not at the moment when the death is revealed. The thing is, is just from a writing point of view, you you could cut all of that, yes. all of that information, and you could just have him wake up, and he's told yes. she, she she was killed. That's an interesting idea. I think that would have it worked better. And so the reason why you're bumping on that feeling sped up is because it's just pure exposition, and they wanted yes. to put it in there to visualize what had happened, so that you didn't. I guess so that it didn't feel too jarring. And you didn't feel cheated of seeing it. That's my sure. guess. Sure. Okay. And I, I, I do think that just cutting that may have fixed it. And us learning when he learned it would have been enough devastation. I like that. That would have been, I, like, I think that would have been better. Let's talk about the ending real quick. In, an, in another great moment of uh, Man on Fire trivia, um, this was actually not the original ending. The original ending, which you can see on YouTube, is... He actually stays alive. He goes back to Lavoz's house, and the the um, the voice prepares to execute him. And Creasy synced up his watch with one of those watch bombs, and blows up the voice's house, killing them both. Oh, that would have been great. What did you? I don't know why that ending was was downgraded in favor of him dying in the car. It's more peaceful. It leaves you. It, it's very. It, I, I think it's pretty moving when you see him die in the car. Um, but I always found it rather unsatisfying when you see um, uh, Giancarlo Giannini's character shooting the voice. You know, it says like the voice was was killed in a in resisting arrest, and I just sort of think that's a bit of a cop out. I don't know. I actually I might be the dissenting voice here because uh, while it makes more like logical sense from Creasy's perspective to try to take out the voice too. And there was a little thing in my head that says like, why is he content to just like not try to finish off the job from a, from a, from an emotional standpoint? Um, I think what it does is it tells us that, uh, that he cares more about, cause if, 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 if that's the thing, then it feels like it's more about just revenge. And the way it is now is it feels like it's a little bit more about the, you know, making sure PETA is safe and that uh, he's not willing to take the risk of failing to kill the voice and then inspire, re-inspiring their wrath. Sure. I, I mean, I think if you'd have asked Tony Scott uh, about why he why he chose that ending instead of the, the, the more action-packed one, it's because I feel like we give Creasy time to rest. Sure. You know, this is a character who's been in turmoil sure. throughout the whole film. And it just is a more peaceful ending, tells you he's at peace, makes the audience, it's a moment of relief for the audience, you know? Well, it makes it tragic. It, makes, it exemplifies the tragedy. I think that's a great point, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you do the other ending, it's like a kick-ass, badass ending. He's badass to the end. Say, yeah, totally. To the end. Yeah, he's badass to the end. He blows himself up to... Yeah, and this is like sad and and introspective and tragic and 
it makes the it makes Creasy's story a tragedy. So let's pivot and uh, we can talk about yeah. One thing that I was tracking while watching this movie was um, they do a lot of so. There's this term that Eric and I use all the time, which is objective correlative. You guys are uh, deep. Yeah, we're we're fucking nerds, dude. I mean, yeah, it's we're, bad. We're, <laughs> It's just it's a it's a stupid nerd term for it just it just means um, a visual symbol that helps us track something that's happening internally. Okay. So there are a subcategory of motifs. All objective correlatives are motifs, but not all motifs are objective correlatives. It's a term that was originally coined by T. S. Eliot. Anyway, so uh, so like, and they do a lot of this in this movie. There's a lot of visual symbols and and not just visual dialogue. The a lot of motifs. That we are tracking. Let's just call. It, let's just call it that. There's a lot of motifs that we are tracking in this movie. Um, a lot of them, and uh, I almost felt like it was too many for me to keep track of. So, like, let me give a few examples, and then I'll ta- I'll talk about the one I want to give. So, like, a couple examples is like um, uh, Creasy Bear, right? So it's like this is a mis- motif that's established. She names her bear after him. She calls him Creasy, and then that's brought back later as uh, proof of life that's how the bad guy is able to prove that she's still alive um so this is kind of a motif that whatever we can say it represents this or represents that whatever it's a, it's a motif that we're tracking another one is uh the guns and bullets it's like a bullet always tells the truth and the gunshot of uh on the swim meet and he, he desensitizes her to that that's how she improves at her swimming and then he tries to use that they call it back at the kidnapping she's in front of the piano lesson he fires the gun uh but she pauses and freaks and in a way it kind of undermines their training we can talk about maybe what that means so but there's these different things these motifs that they're calling back the one that was maybe most interesting to me was the bird there's this bird when he shows up at the house he goes into his room and there's a bird some kind of tropical bird that is left over from the previous bodyguard that belongs to the previous bodyguard and it's, it's being annoying and he tries to let it go and uh it's and then it comes back and that's basically the arc of the bird. Like that's basically, it doesn't really come back again later. They don't really use it for anything else. They just kind of bring it up. They show us the bird. Uh, There's a moment with it. He tries to let it go. It comes back and that's that. And they move on. And I was thinking about like, what does that mean? What is that doing for the story? And um, I had a bunch of ideas about maybe what it's doing for the story, uh, but I'm kind of divided. And so I wanted to kind of get your guys' opinions on this. Do you think that is serving some really important function like function for the story? Or like if they chop that out of the story, is something big lost? Am I missing something? I don't know. Well, the bird, he lets the bird go, doesn't he? The bird belonged to Emilio, the previous bodyguard. Yeah. And I think he sets it, he, it. It's how he bonds with the girl, isn't it? Because, he's, because he, he sets it free. Yeah. I I just think it's... I think it speaks to what's going on inside him. You know, it shows that he's that he's opening up. You know, he he lets the bird out. It's kind of uh, you know, a way of showing that he's you know, opening up himself. You know, if you want to be super vis- super metaphorical about it, he's opening the cage like he's opening up to her. You know, I'm not sure if the bird itself has any I mean, maybe it has some kind of symbolism or something. I I don't know. But some um, to me, it spoke to him opening up himself. On a parallel track, because that's his advice to PETA, which when she's caught between doing what her parents want, piano, and doing the thing she wants to do, which is swimming. Like It's almost like letting the bird go is foreshadowing for his eventual advice to PETA, which is like, be free, do what you want to do, not don't fall into what the, your parents' expectations are. Yeah, not even from like a metaphorical standpoint. Like I don't even, I almost don't even care what it represents. Like that's like a literary criticism, whatever thing. thing. Yeah, I think we can, we can, I think one of the really important things to remember um, in screenwriting is um, you got to, you got to screen out the stuff like, uh, you know, metaphor, symbolism, all this kind of stuff, because that's real lit crit type, type, type thing. You know, and it, and and it doesn't really help you connect with the emotions of the characters. Yeah. So well, that's kind of my point. So like, I'm interested in it from not from not necessarily from like a lit crit metaphor uh, perspective, but more from like a structural storytelling uh, perspective. It's almost like a mini Chekhov's gun. It's like the the Chekhov's gun rule is set it up in the first act, bring it back in the third act. The point of that 
is that it's global. It's this arc that is taking a, uh, taking place across the entire story. And this is like, this bird sees its entire arc played out within the course of like 25 minutes or 20 minutes. Um, so it's like many, it's like, it has an arc. It does have an arc, but it's just small within one act. It's funny. Uh, Cause I never, I never thought of it like, like that. I just thought of it as the bird that he sets free. Um, but yeah. um, that's interesting to hear you say that. So, yeah. So it's interesting. It's like, I, I, I don't see, you don't see a lot. You don't see that happen very often, which is just kind of why it caught my eye. It not a lot of stories do that. Um, and there's a couple things like that in this story that kind of have the same thing that have just like a little arc and that's kind of it. And they're never really brought back again, but it works. It works. The, the, we- the weird thing is, is that whenever we see animals in films, we always start to care about them. So, when I see the bird get let out of the cage, I always think oh, that's a bit cruel. You know, it was safe in the cage. It's going to fly out into Mexico city and like, it'll be eaten by like a Raven or something. And then I always wonder what happened to Peter's dog. Right. <laughs> right. The dog is another one. Sam. It's a, the, the, we even know its name, Sam. What happened to the big question for me is not what happened to Peter. What happened to Sam? <laughs> right. That's another perfect example. Like it's the it's set up. She talks about how she wants a dog. They get the dog. Poor dog. We give her a dog and then it vanishes from the story. And I'm just like, yes. I'm like, I'm like Creasy. You know, can't you adopt yeah. Sam? Maybe you can keep him in the car while you blow up Fuentes. Or, you know, <laughs> maybe there'll be a safe place for Sam. Yeah, the sequel. Creasy and Sam. No, but he's dead. So it's kind of a spin-off series. <laughs> it's just Sam eating his dead face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I guess there's not a lot to say there. It's just kind of an interesting thing that I saw that not a lot of stories do. And you know what? I guess what I'm trying to say, I guess one, I guess one of the takeaways for me is just like, it's just a cool thing. And it's just like, it'd be cool to see other stories do that um, because it's you, it's, levering, it's leveraging the satisfying power of, of the call, setup callback Chekhov's gun rule um, but in order to accomplish small things that need to be accomplished within each act. And so, yeah, I don't know. It's just kind of a cool thing. I, it, it's more stories should do that. So anyways, to add on to Cody's point about objective correlatives, this movie was saturated with them. There were so many, specifically the ones that depicted Creasy's relationship and love for PETA. So we already talked about Creasy Bear, which was perhaps the most powerful but there were a bunch of tiny ones that were really subtle. I believe this was right before the piano lesson. Peta picks a dandelion for Creasy and gives it to him. And then that is the first thing that he takes out when he's in her room after it's been revealed that she's died. And then it's at that moment you get the one-two punch of the dandelion and then he reads the diary and it brings back Creasy Bear, where she writes over and over again, I love my Creasy Bear. And that really, it, it makes the devastation hit you in a two, in a, in a two shot. Yeah, absolutely. It just, it, it, this movie's constantly playing on your sense of tragedy for Creasy. And the sense that this guy's been made to live again, this guy's been allowed to live again, and then he's had it taken away from him. Another objective correlative and this is a verbal one one that you hear a lot where as he goes on his killing spree the thing he hears over and over again is i'm a professional right interesting and he he even he even comments on how he's sick and tired of hearing it i'm sick and tired of hearing because you know what it reminded me of in every movie about nazis whether it's about nazis at the time or like someone who was a nazi who now it's about their life afterwards. You always hear the phrase like, I was just following orders. Right. And this had the same vibe as that sort of thing. It's like, look, I'm just a professional. I don't, and they're trying to absolve themselves of responsibility in this terrible act. And Creasy is not buying it at all. Well, you know what? Okay, well, there's, you made two really interesting points, right? You know why you always hear that line? I don't. Because that was famously declared by the Nuremberg post-war trials as, uh, not a uh, defense, right? Just because you're following orders doesn't mean it's a legitimate defense uh, against the fact that you right. may have been responsible for the deaths of innocent people, right? Right. Yes. Creasy goes to Fuentes. I'm. Everyone's telling me that I'm a professional, and I'm sick and tired of hearing it. You know, because, because you know, and it's it's a way of telling the audience. You know, it doesn't matter 
that's not a defense just because you're a professional doesn't uh mean that that's an excuse for kidnapping a little girl you know in the same way as saying i'm a professional hasn't got creasy off the hook for all the demons that are following him around for all the things he's done around the world before this movie starts a really interesting point that i heard about that uh Cody and I have a mutual friend, Stu, and he actually got his master's degree in neuroscience. And apparently the data suggests that if you are just following orders, you, you're, you psychologically feel a lessened sense of... Responsibility. Res uh, well, not just responsibility, but agency. You feel a lessened sense of agency. Like you literally do not feel like you have control over your actions. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? From a moral standpoint, because your friend is probably an expert and this is just my opinion. But I feel like one of the ways that people do bad things in this world is when they feel that their actions are legitimized. You know, and and that clearly is what the Nuremberg defense was all about. You know, people were told it's OK for you to do bad things. They're actually good. And this movie Man on Fire is actually a deep examination of the fact that when you do bad things, they make you a bad person. It, there is no defense. And so we've taken someone who's done incredibly bad things his whole life and we're putting him on the on the moral hook for that when this movie begins. Yeah, yeah, and it's really only through doing good things that he's able to be redeemed. It's like, yeah, it's and like, the idea of redemption permeates this movie from scene one to the to when it ends. Yeah, you've got the, yeah. The, the, this. This movie is filled with images of churches and birds flying in front of candles in churches and people killing themselves and uh, you know, um, from start to finish, this is a movie about is redemption possible? If you're a bad person. Can you become good? Is it possible for someone who's damned, who's who's gone beyond the, 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 the pale, who's done evil things, is it possible for them to ever become good? Right, right. By the end of the movie, it just the audience is 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 encouraged to answer that question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it seems like the the answer that the movie proffers is like you're only as good as what you do. Absolutely. So it's just you know, like, and, do, and you know, a really interesting point is that we actually never find out what Creasy did. It's just hinted at. Like, like I said at the beginning, he, you know, his first line to Rayburn is, do you think God will ever forgive us for what we've done? Right. That's why I think this, the, the story is so interesting. Yes. A few more objective correlatives before we close this chapter. Uh, I noticed at the beginning of the movie, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think this was in the cold open when it just goes through what a normal kidnapping is like and how it usually turns out. I believe the voice tells the person the most important thing in life is family. And then that comes back at the very end when it's the voice's family that's now on the hook because of Creasy threatening them. And he repeats that exact same line. So there's another thing where they close that loop. Blue Bayou. That was another one where uh, that song was very active in the first act of the movie. And finally, when Creasy, he's in the middle of hugging PETA, but in gaining her life, part of the offer was he had to give up his own life. And he says something like, I'm going to Blue Bayou. I mean, this movie's playing with so many ideas, you know, I mean, First of all, just as a bit of trivia about the, the film, because I know everything about the, this film, right? The uh, the uh, the 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 cold open was actually uh, shot as a as an entire sequence, right? And it was uh, it was actually just cut down to being an opening credit sequence because the movie was felt to be too long, right? Um, like you brought up, the idea of um, family being the most important thing. It's really interesting. The way that's explored throughout the film is really interesting. Just the same as the idea of being a professional is, is explored. You know, the idea that you can do evil things, but does that like, does that make it okay if you have a family? Like, how does your family work? If you're a bad person, is, is your family still sacred? Can you still seek defense? I mean, you, one of the most interesting moments of the film for the audience is when Creasy 
intimidates the vo- the voice's family. I mean, that really puts you in a morally uncomfortable position because you've got his pregnant wife. He claims he's separated from her, but still pregnant wife and his brother, uh, uh, you know, a gunpoint. And even the hardest members of the audience are going to be, you know, you you don't feel good about what Chris is doing. Yes. And I can't help but, but, but feel like part of that is because you know that in a really twisted way, he's actually doing what's been done to him, to the Voz, to the, the, the I, I, sorry, I, I, I keep saying La Voz, right? Uh, because, um, you know, and it's a, it's a way of exploring like, you know, even Creasy, I feel like Creasy goes to a, to a, to a, probably his darkest moment in, in, you know, at that time. But he doesn't, but he doesn't cross the line because it's at, because it's at, and, and he would have, that's the thing. You know, he would have. Let me ask you a question. Do, do you think, do you think he would have hurt the pregnant woman? Absolutely. Wow. I, I absolutely think he would have. I think the only thing that stopped him was proof of life of PETA when she said the name was Creasy Bear and that was brought back at that moment. Because what's interesting is that if if he'd have hurt the pregnant woman, you'd have lost the audience right there. Yes. I, and I think just in time, he was saved. And I think that was a really smart storytelling decision. Uh, I think he was playing a, a game of brink, brinksmanship. Because I, I think... Yeah, I think the reason that moment works so well is at that point, I think the audience absolutely believes he would have done it. Absolutely. And then the final objective correlative, uh, this was brought up earlier where we talked about the necklace that was given at the restaurant. That's the very last thing that he has his hands on. The St. Jude. Has, yes, the St. Jude's that he has his hands on as he bleeds out in their car. So it's, so it's like the dandelion, creasy bear, the St. Jude's necklace are all... Yeah, representations of this intimate bond between Creasy and Peter that reappear frequently throughout the movie. The Saint Jude is a is a visual depiction of her love for him. Yes, and it's the last thing he holds on to. It's, it's, it's the only thing keeping him alive, and it's the last thing he has in his hand. He, it's the last thing he has in his hand. Very much, he's holding on. Hand. I want to make a quick point about forgiveness because his. We, we talked about how in the first act, his idea of like, can he be forgiven changes because at, the reason he tries to commit suicide is that the answer is no at first, but then he sees that he's redeemable through his love for this girl. But then as soon as that is taken away from him, and this is actually my favorite line in the movie, uh, he says in the midst of his revenge spree, because he's asked about whether or not he can forgive them or something about will God forgive the kidnappers for what they've done. And he says, forgiveness is between them and God. My job is to arrange the meeting. Yeah, it's a great, so, it's a great line, right? So his, his conception of forgiveness changes post kidnapping of PETA, where it's almost like he backtracks and that's just him verbalizing his like, new outlook on life out loud at that point in the movie yeah he, he has he has absolutely no pity or forgiveness for the kidnappers he 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 this character completely walks back any humanity that he may have gained by the end of the first act and so he's literally a killing machine and he's driven by the anger of someone who was allowed to think it was okay to be vulnerable and then got a got a got a kick in the balls, so he's he's got an especially wicked sense of anger, you know. Absolutely, and 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 you know nowhere is that clearer than you know when he says you know, uh, you know forgiveness is between them and God. My job's just to arrange the meeting. He's telling the subtext of that line is, I really just don't give a shit, Senor. It's part of why the ending works for me when he lets himself be killed in a or taken and and die in a sort of whimper fashion as opposed to with fire, uh, because it's a sort of another way of committing suicide. It's like he he knows that he oh he, he's this this whole movie is Creasy trying again to kill himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But 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 the emphasis is not on the suicide if he blows himself up uh, to, in order to take out. It's more like a means to an end. Whereas this way, it's like. Uh, it's like he knows that 
it even if he had been like rede- like so the moment of the su- of the attempted suicide uh and it fa- the gu- the gun fails it's almost like one in- like his in- the character's interpretation is like okay i get a second chance and then he kind of blows the second chance like you're talking about it's like he backslides he he goes on a killing spree again he does more horrific shit and so it's like almost kind of him acknowledging like you don't get a third chance. It's time to. It's interesting, isn't it? Because this, in many ways, this character is constantly punishing themselves. This, is like, this character's in real turmoil, and the and the I mean, just to put it mildly, and the idea of suicide is a very powerful force in the story. Yeah, you know, it's made especially especially horrific by the fact that Tony Scott actually committed suicide. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow! No, 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 Tony. I mean, we don't have to. You can edit this part, but yeah, Tony Scott jumped jumped off the San Pedro Bridge, and it was it was in 2011, I think. But it, and it was it was rumored to be because he he was diagnosed with inoperable brain cancer, and he had been given a few months to, to live. So what's interesting is that in this movie, uh, you know, this movie is about tough guys, right? This movie is about the tough alpha male who can take anything like doesn't give a fuck super tough old school version of it and then it pulls back the you know you know and it puts that into focus and says actually that's bullshit these tough guys aren't tough at all you know they're actually just as weak as you and me and that's that's what's so interesting about creasy because he's such a he's such a pillar of strength and yet he's so weak yeah one dial that I would have liked to see turned a little bit more was when he was doing the killing uh, in each of the sort of uh, t- torture porn scenes. Um, I, I, I think I would have he, he kind of Creasy kind of had this attitude of he, they kind of played it for coolness. There was kind of like, yeah, I don't even give a fuck, like whatever, man. He was kind of a cool and aloof when he was doing it. And I would have liked more darkness there. Don't you, don't you, hold on. How much more darkness do you want? Don't you think he's, I mean, this guy is just. Well, not just in what he's doing, but the acting choices that are being made. He, he displays no empathy towards his victims whatsoever. And we know he's capable of it. But he, but he also doesn't display very much like hatred. It's very just like, Hey, we got to get it done. Sorry. It's because he's a professional sure but i feel like kind of the whole point is that this is his descent into darkness and this is not he's not this isn't a job he got hired for right this is he's doing this for personal reasons i mean look this guy displays no empathy towards his victims and yet the 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 thing is that we know that he's capable of it because we've spent an hour with it with with this guy knowing that he's actually a a very deep thinking uh, sympathetic, um, uh, um, emotional guy, just buried under all of that. So it makes it especially horrifying when you see him killing people like like that, torturing them. But he tortures them emotionally. Sure. I mean, don't you think giving the cigarette was a moment of empathy? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. He gives well, he gives the cop a cigarette. To bounce off of that point, I did notice that there were some moments where he let people go. So Correct. In- the moment that's popping in my brain right now is the lady who is left at the rave. And he, the only reason he lets her go is because she has another kidnapped girl. And this is... Yeah. That moment foreshadows... It's almost line for line. That moment where she says, like, I have the girl. And then he goes, girl, what girl? What girl are you talking about? That's almost line for line the same thing he says to the voice when he says, I'll give you the girl back. And the second time meaning PETA. But this first time, it's not PETA. It's a different girl who was kidnapped. Yeah, it's, another, it, 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 it's, a, it's another girl that the same group have kidnapped, which, which yes. also builds up how bad they are and how they deserve whatever's coming to them. Yes. But what's, exactly. in, but what's interesting is that Creasy's moral code uh, allows him to spare people's lives if they display goodness. Yes. And so th- this goes back to the point I made earlier where I said a good story beat works on multiple levels. So not only does this moment show the moral nuance that Creasy is displaying even in this revenge 
the, the, the savagery that he's oh, displaying. Yeah. He yeah. does have some principle. He has a little bit of humanity remaining at that moment. And then that B also foreshadows when it's revealed that PETA is alive. Because we think she's dead. We think she's come dead. But they plant that seed in your brain. Like it almost gives you a little mini hope that Pete is alive before you realize, oh shoot, it's the wrong girl before the big payoff comes back at the end. I mean, um, this, um, this movie is just all about this guy's last 1% of humanity battery. Yes. But then at the same time, like I said earlier, uh, I think that as he continues on, because I, I think the ending hinges on the fact that you believe that he would have killed the pregnant wife. Like, even though she's essentially an innocent bystander. Uh, I'm on the fence about that. Uh, I'm not sure if he would have done. I think he was just playing a game of brinksmanship with the voice. And I actually don't think Creasy knows if he's going to or not. But that's just me. Sure. Sure. Uh, so I, in my perspective, it's that, like, he sort of gets worse as the movie goes on. And I believe that he would do it. But maybe that's just another example of the nuance where it's like, he's just saying he would do it to get what he wants. Why, why do you feel like that hinges on that? Because it's the moment of, of almost becoming truly, truly irredeemable. Yeah. This yeah. guy. Yeah. I mean, it would be, you know, it's a mis you know, as a storyteller, like it's a mistake to obviously it's a huge mistake to make your character become irredeemable. Like they, if they do things that are as bad as what the villains do, then you lose the audience forever. So if, 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 if he would have hurt the pregnant woman, it would be you know the movie would have um would have ended well in the same way that the only thing that stopped him from killing the woman at the rave was this other girl being alive the only thing that stops him from killing the pregnant women woman uh from killing the pregnant woman is Peta being alive so so that would be my logic because i i think he would have killed that woman in the rave too had it not been for that reveal yeah i don't know no i think you're making a really good point eric because like that's kind of the point is that like both of your points are the point in the sense that he absolutely would have been made irredeemable and that's a dangerous thing that they're playing with it's like they're 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 bringing us right up to the edge and they're impl and they're may maybe implying that like he might have become truly irredeemable and that would have been horrific but he was able to just avoid going off that cliff once again each time because of PETA and that toying with that edge is kind of the point and the danger that that represents. It's a good moment. And that's part of what I mean though, when I also say like, I, I would have loved to see actually a little bit more darkness because um, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, it, it's a small thing. It's a subtle thing. It's just like a two clicks on the dial thing. Uh, but, but his, the, the degree to which he was reserved it felt like it was mirroring what he was talking about. It's like, well, they're a perfect, they're just a professional doing their job and he's just a professional doing his job. And, and like, I kind of wanted to see an asymmetry there. I kind of wanted to see they're just professionals doing their job, but now it's personal for him. And this is, we're seeing the guy go off the dark end. He's going off the end of the, 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 the deep, this deep end of the pool. He's going in deep into the dark. He's really, this is personal for him. He's not just a professional anymore. Um, and, and the and the depths of depravity you can go to when that's your motivation and when you're in that headspace, and this is a subtle thing because it felt like it felt like that was justified. Like I would have gone on him in that journey. I would not have been turned off as a viewer. I wouldn't have gone, oh fuck that, he's an asshole now. I felt like I was I was taken to that place. I was like, they killed the girl, they killed Peta. Meaning I was like, I'm like, let's fuck some people up, you know. And it's like I want to see him go to that place where you know it's really it's really there and. And the fact that he didn't quite get there, it was almost like I was almost like, "Come on, man, just let's go!" Like, no, because he uses because he uses his anger because it, it, it look he uses his anger as fuel. To this this character, right? This guy is just a, a ball of rage, and he's mainly angry at himself. He, he's angry. He's angry for what he's allowed his life to become. He's angry for what he's done specifically, uh, and he and he's he's just a guy who's punishing himself from minute one yeah and of course it, it is the ultimate refutation of the the idea of i'm just a pro professional because it's completely personal to him what happens you know yeah yeah sure it, i mean absolutely it is right and that's my point it's like i just i would have loved to see that a little bit more in certain moments 
Um, uh, and maybe, maybe that's just that's just a personal thing. Obviously, it's it plays different a little bit differently for everybody. But I mean, the really the moment that one of the moments that just stands out for me is like he's sitting in the car and he's like being nice to the guy. He like gives him a cigarette and he's like, yeah, yeah, hey, I get it. It's all good. All right, all right. Off to the next life for you, my friend. And it's just he's there's this flippancy. It's it's flippant. Yeah, there's a dispassionate nature. Yeah, yeah. It's it's there's a they make a point of it and. He's making a point of that, a point that he's really trying to go out of his way to be dispassionate and flippant. It. It's like sarcastic almost. It's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I'm gonna, uh, I got a, I got a torture appointment at 11 a.m. and then I got my, I got to get a haircut at noon. And I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. I totally, I'm not sure. I totally got that decision. There's also a discrepancy between, like, if you're gonna play him cool, maybe you shouldn't name your movie Man on Fire. Because when you imagine like a man like enraged, like you know, you don't expect like a guy on fire like, oh yeah, sure, sure, take your time. Take your time. Okay. You're dead now. You're dead. But yeah, but the thing is what you guys are what you guys are skirting around is the fact that he's a professional, right? That idea is very important in the story. And professionals don't lose their cool. But didn't he get upset when his the people he was fighting said that to him? Of course, that's the whole drama that there's the drama right there. Right? Because it's all an examination of this idea of what, what, what is to be a professional. So, so here's a question per, that may be interesting to explore. So do you think that moment when Fuentes says to him, I'm a professional and he loses his cool, do you think that's a turning point emotional for him? Do you think it, something pivots in that moment, Matt? I think that, I think that we're, just seeing, we're just seeing him let his guard down for a moment, aren't we? Because he really, he really knows that idea is bullshit because he's lived it. This is a guy who said he's a professional his whole life and he's ended up doing unspeakable things and ruining other people's lives. And he knows that that's bullshit. You can't just do this stuff and then go, I'm a professional. It just doesn't work. It's, it's, it's nonsense. It's like the Nuremberg defense. You can't go, I was just yeah. following orders. It just, it just doesn't work. You can't no, do something. It's like, it, it, it's like you said at the beginning. It's like you can't do something and then... Yeah, if you do something, you have to take responsibility for it, right? You kidnap a girl, you have to say, I, I did it. You can't go, I was just doing my job. You can't go, I've killed this guy, but I'm a professional. It just doesn't work. You have to own the consequences of your actions. And Creasy's all about owning the consequences of his actions in every moment of this film. It, in fact, it's about him, his dealing with those consequences is what is what peter actually helps him with yeah sure well and i, I mean I, I would go even a step further and say like it's not just that you have to own their own it it's that you will regardless either way even if you don't want to, even if you what, don't want to. whatever you do you are gonna have you have to take responsibility for what you do well no 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 my point is even a step further it's not just that you have to like you ought to it's it almost feels like the point of the movie is that like you will pay the psychological price. It's inescapable. It's inescapable. It's inescapable. If you, if you do something bad, it, it you you uh, some way or another, whether or not you initiate it or someone else does, you will have to take responsibility for your actions. And that is what is the very de yeah. definition of justice, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And this movie yeah. is definitely. all about justice yeah yeah and he's paying that price at the beginning of the movie yeah. what is the th this this movie is about asking the audience audience what do you think is justice in a place where there is no justice is it acceptable to bring your own at some point in this film rayburn goes crease is going to bring more justice than years of your cause this movie is taking place in a society where the concept of justice itself is in doubt. The backdrop of this film is somewhere where there is no justice, right? So Creasy is bringing it himself. But it also, it, you know, it allows the audience to ask the question, you know, is vigilantism okay? Is it, is it okay to take matters into your own hands? And it doesn't answer that question. At no point in this film, do does, does does the writer tell you it's okay to do what Creasy did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. I mean, a, 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 a story that just tells you the answer is it's it's not a it's not art. It's propaganda. Yeah. yeah in most in most action films, uh, you know the um, remember the the genre like we said at the beginning the genre that Tony Scott helped to create. In most action films, you'll get this reassuring moment at the end where you know that the hero's done a good thing. 
you know, die hard, you know, he embraces his wife in the arms of the police and everything's going to be okay, you know, as the snowflakes fall on Los Angeles Christmas Eve 2091, right? But this movie doesn't have that moment. This movie singularly does not have the moment where you're told everything's going to be okay and what Creasy did is all right. It leaves it open to you. He dies in the back of the car. Uh, uh, Creasy, uh, uh, Peter and her mother drive away from Junction 34 of the highway to Puebla. There is no answer. Absolutely. So there's this idea that this idea that being a professional is this firewall that you put up in your life that allows you to not let things in, not, not let things affect you, and that you can remain protected from that. He, the whole point is that he believes that's bullshit. And he makes this decision in the early part of the movie to let Pete, he spent his whole life keeping that firewall up, being a professional, it hasn't worked. So he decides in the first part of the movie, he's not going to do that anymore. He's going to let PETA in. He's going to, he's going to let this job, this is a job he got hired for. He's supposed to just not be, he's supposed to be dispassionate, but he lets her in. He lets, becomes, makes it personal and he pays the price for that. The price is that he gives her power over him. And then if she gets kidnapped and something bad happens to her, he gives her the power to control his emotions and control where he goes. And he, the price he pays for that is that he, he goes to an irrede- essentially an irredeemable place. I mean, not irredeemable in the sense that, but he, he, he backslides in the sense of he, he does violence again. The, mo- the movie's all about how being a professional is not a defense, you know? And it's, it's, it's the, it's the, it's the defense that look, if, if your day job is you're a kidnapper, right? How do you live with yourself? How do you get up and go to work in the morning? Right? If what you do is you kidnap people, you kill people, you're a causer of harm. How do you live with that day to day? Well, the movie tells you really clearly, all of these people live with what they do by saying, I'm a professional. Fuentes right? A corrupt police officer, a member of a union of cor- corrupt pol- police officers. Uh, he's a kidnapper. Uh, he's an opportunist. Um, he's a, he's a traffic, he's a, he's a thoroughly evil person, right? How does he live? With- no one goes to work thinking I'm an evil person. He lives with it by saying, I'm a professional. The people who work for The Voice, they're def- the, 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 the way they get up and go to work every day is by saying, I'm a professional. I'm a professional. I'm a professional. And the movie just examines how that's bullshit because Creasy has lived that his whole life and it's now become unsustainable to him. He can't live that lie anymore. And that's when the movie begins. And that's when we meet him but crossing the over the border. Is that, right. But the interesting thing is that the decision to not be a professional anymore is what does him in. Makes him, makes him absolutely. He loses control. Right. So it's like it does serve a purpose. Being a professional, it, it's a it's a yin yang. Right. It's like it means that you don't get to you don't give a little girl power over you that ultimately leads to your destruction. Yeah. It's like, look, I mean, it's it's it, look, it's the thing that we talked about at the beginning. It's like ask anyone in the armed forces, you know, um, that they, they, they go to work every day thinking I'm a professional, you know, right. but they have to do terrible things that are going to haunt them the rest of their life. And that it's that uh, kind of legality that allows them to actually do it, you know? Um, and that's true of any really difficult job, isn't it? Yes, yes, absolutely. It's like um, the moral defense. It's like the only defense for... Anyway, it's super interesting. But anyway, th- this movie is all about that. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally agree with you. And I, to, me, yeah, to me, the most interesting thing is not the movies, whether or not it says that that is morally defensible or not. It's the, no, the movie says it's morally indefensible. What's that? The movie says it's morally indefensible. No, no, sure. I, I, I mean, I, I think you're probably right. But I'm just saying that it also explores it from a psychological angle, which is more, even more interesting to me than the moral angle, because the psychological angle is not like, is it defensible or not? That question being explored, I mean, it's um, what psychological ramifications will it have on you? If you try to do that. Yeah. It's going to break you. If you go through your life saying I'm a professional 
uh, and using it as an excuse to do terrible things, eventually you're going to have to pay. Yeah. Well, the, really, the movie says you pay either way, I feel like. Maybe I'm wrong here, but I feel like that's the point. Of the the point. Well, I feel like one of the points of the movie, and this is why this, I, I like this. I think this is actually really cool about the movie. Is it feels like it's saying you pay either way. It's like choose how you pay. If you, the because the way Creasy pays is that it's like if you if you if you if you if you if you say I'm a professional and you do horrible things, how do you pay? Creasy comes and kills you. You eventually anger some dude who's gonna go fuck your shit up. You sure, he's the he's the. Yeah, he's the he's the personification of justice in the story. Right. But if you don't do that and you let people in, you also pay. How do you pay? They get kidnapped. The people that you love get kidnapped. So you pay psychologically either way, and it's kind of like choose your poison. It's like you're you get you have to take poison. Which poison do you choose? I don't I don't have anything else I was gonna I was gonna bring up. I just really enjoyed the opportunity to watch the film again. Like I said, this was a big this is a big movie for me. I've I've seen it. Hundreds of times, well, probably a hundred. I think it's one of the best movies um, of, the, of the early 2000s. It was better than I remembered. I, I think it's just such a, a, a powerful story because it's so un, unexpectedly emotional. You know, it's such an interest. It's, it's a, you know, I love those like super violent revenge stories. You know, Tony Scott was a guy that obviously totally got off on that kind of story. You know, he was actually... Um, one of the people considered to remake the wild bunch, which is one of my favorite films um, in his later career. So, you know, I really like this film. I think it's, it really speaks to me every time I watch it, I see something new about it, you know, and um, I love Tony Scott's visual style. I love the kind of characters that he talks about. I love the kind of characters he's interested in. And I think that the, the relationship between Creasy and and Peter is really genuinely moving and really holds up the test. This, this movie has not dated at all. And I think that's, that's, uh, you know, you know, indicative of, you know, how strong it continues to be. I think that Tony Scott is one of the great undirect, one of the great un, un, underrated directors of our time. And on a personal level, I really, um, see eye to eye. I, I, I really empathize with him because he's also an English immigrant. You know, he came to Hollywood to to make his career. Um, and, you know, um, I just think he's a really cool filmmaker and I really enjoyed the chance to watch this film again. Yeah. Well, dude, we really appreciate you coming on the podcast. It Thank you for having here. me. It was awesome to have your, your, uh, your, you're such a great writer. It's awesome to have your perspective and, uh, and your passion for the film. Well, 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 that the jury's out on that. Not for me, my friend. But uh, it was, it was great. It was great to be on the podcast, and thank you so much, having me. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Do you want to do you want to plug the shit out of something? Do you want to plug your projects to our meager listener base? No, I would not be so gauche or so trashy as to talk about my own projects on air. Please do. That's what one of the small things that we can offer you back. Listen. The job of a writer is to is to write, not to talk about it. And I think Ernest Hemingway said that. One of the great underrated writers of uh, no, she's not. Well, no, he's he's underrated now. He's not in fashion now. All right. Well, I'll give a quick plug then. Matt Graham, TV magnate, tycoon of media, is a great writer. He's got a new show coming out on Netflix India. When we know the name of it, we'll put it in the description. Watch the shit out of that, everybody. Thank you, Matt. <laughs>